someday. Amen. But you know, there's only one way you'll get there today, and that's through his blood. Right. But uh, if you've received his blood, you know, there's nothing else. There's nothing on this earth or, or, or without of this earth that can take you out of his hand this morning. Because right. if we've been saved, not only are we free today, but we're free indeed Amen. for all eternity. Amen. condemnation coming yeah. to you. There's only heaven waiting for us. No matter what we're going through, we might be in a valley. I'm glad we have a lily yeah. that'll go with us in that valley. If you'll stand, please turn your hymn books page number 100. Page number 100. I'm glad we have a lily of the valley this morning. We'll sing the first and the last verse. Page number 100. I have found a friend in He's everything to be. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. A lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, 
So much you may be seated. Brother Brian's going to come at this time and sing for us this morning. Pray for Brother Brian as he's singing. I want to brag on God for just a moment. Amen. Uh, I was having some issues with my car. It was a great little car. God blessed me so much. With that little car, I didn't know what was going on, and I, I left the job a lot closer to start having to drive to Greenville every day. And um, I didn't know what I was going to find when I was out there. And he blessed me with that little car. It's good on gas mileage. It was very reliable. I never had a nickel's worth of trouble out of that car. Then I noticed something was going on. I took it and I said, "Well, you got this, you got that." And it's it's not too surprising. Once you get a car paid off, I think that's when the warranty boys. <laughs> But I was uh, praying. I said, God, just let me find something. I know there's something out there for me. And I, it took me about two hours. On the same day that I pray, God has blessed me with another little car. On top of that, he said, well, we'll let them give you this much for your old car, too. And I wasn't expecting them to get that. And just right when I'm thinking, God, this blessing's about to run out. Another blessing just coming yeah. on the corner. Yeah. And regardless, a car is just a car. I, you know, you can go out and get a car nowadays. It really doesn't take that much. But beyond a car, beyond a house, beyond anything, I'd rather have Jesus Amen. more than anything I know. I'll probably cry through this. <laughs>
nothing in this world that do better for you than Jesus. No matter what you can buy or what you can get, he's the answer today that you're looking for. You can't buy it. You can't get it anywhere else. Just through him, through his blood this morning. Amen. That should be our desire this morning is just to have Jesus rule over our hearts and rule over our lives. Amen. Brother Roger. Absolutely. Hey. Amen, Brother Roger. And yeah, Brother Roger went through quite the spell there. And Miss Martha is still recovering, so keep her in your prayers and, and both of them as they continue to heal and, and come back into, uh, into the church. Amen. It's good to see them this morning. It's good to see them. But you never know, folks. You just never know. You might be going for a routine scheduled checkup, and, and next day you're having surgery. So it pays to be, to be right with the Lord every day. Every day, we ought to choose Jesus over all this other stuff we have. Uh, this time, we're going to have our ushers come forward. We're going to receive our offering this morning. The ushers will come forward, please. Um, it's a privilege just to be able to give today, be able to give just a small portion of what God's given us to give back to Him. And it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's a commandment. This isn't, this isn't something that we do because we want to or because we, we feel like we should, but the Lord has commanded a tithe, and uh, if we'll listen to him and we'll obey his word, then he'll bless us for it, I believe. I believe he'll bless us for it if we just do those things. Uh, but we're going to receive our offering this morning. Brother Bill, it's good to have Brother Bill back with us. He's had some health issues as well. He's uh, able to come back last week, but we're going to have Brother Bill, if you'll please pray for us this morning, and the Lord will bless us all. Hey. Don't forget about the job.
day we're going to reach that city. Amen. She's playing about Beulah Land. What a day that'll be. Amen. Thank you, Deborah, for playing for us. It's good to have you this morning. All the way out from Arkansas. Always a pleasure to have her with us, and we enjoy hearing her play the piano when she's here. But this morning we're going to have Brother Robert's going to come. He's going to be uh, bringing the word this morning, whatever the Lord's laid on his heart. Brother Robert, uh, you come and, and this time and uh, just preach to us whatever God have you to preach to us. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jamie. Okay. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. You know, several weeks ago when the pastor asked me if I would uh, bring the message this morning, I realized once again the awesome responsibility it is for the man of God to stand in the pulpit and to preach God's word. And um, I began to pray and ask the Lord what he would have me to bring this morning. And he kept drawing my attention to this passage that we're going to read in a couple of minutes. And uh, I looked and I searched and I prayed and, and I realized that... Uh, in 45 years of preaching the gospel, I had never used this particular text before. And uh, I pray that uh, as we bring the message this morning that the Lord wants us to bring, that it will be a blessing to you. But most of all, we pray that if there's one here that's not saved, that the Lord will use this message and anything that I might say to bring conviction. And this might be the day you come to know Christ as your Savior. So, in John's Gospel, chapter 12, I'm going to read verses 20 to 28. And if you would please stand. Something new that our pastor started, so we will keep with that. So, John, chapter 12, verse 20. John 12, 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast... The same came therefore to Philip, which is of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. And if any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause I am come unto this hour. Rather glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Father, we thank you for the reading of thy word. Lord, we pray that you might use me to be a blessing to the folks here today. Most of all, Lord, as we preach thy word, we pray the Holy Spirit might work in the hearts of those that are not where they ought to be with thee. We'll rejoice and thank you for all that's done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In the passage that we just read, the Lord Jesus Christ in just six more days is facing the cross. A Easter cantata that has been around for a number of years is entitled Born to Die. Ron Hamilton was the one that came up with that. But that's why the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world. He was born to die. He came, he lived here 33 years, he was the son of God, he performed many miracles, he raised people from the dead, uh, he preached, and six days after the events that we read about, he would go to the cross, and he would suffer, and he would pay the sin debt for all of humanity. 
Now the Greeks mentioned in this passage, they were in Jerusalem along with the Jews for the Feast of the Passover. These Greeks, no doubt, were, were converts. They were Gentiles that had converted to Judaism. And we see that it's their desire to speak to Jesus. They had no doubt, even in Greece, heard a lot about the Lord Jesus Christ and about his ministry. They no doubt had heard about all of the miracles or many of the miracles that the Lord had performed. So now they come and they say to Philip, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip goes to Andrew and tells Andrew, there's some Greeks here that want to see Jesus. And Andrew tells the Lord Jesus Christ, and in verses 23 to 28, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about his upcoming crucifixion. And he speaks about what's going to happen, about how he's going to die, and about how because of his death he will ultimately be glorified. And then he talks about serving him and living for him. But then in verse 27 he says, My soul is troubled. Remember on the night before Christ was crucified how he agonized. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Then finally in verse 28 we see the Father. He speaks and he says, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Uh, again, that's after Jesus said, Father, glorify thy name. I want to speak for just a few minutes today on the subject, Sir, we would see Jesus. Four things that I would like for us to see today concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, I'd like for us to see the Lord Jesus Christ in his sovereignty. You say, what in the world does that mean, Brother Robert? Well, first of all, in the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ, remember that he was the creator of the universe. John's Gospel, chapter 1, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things that were made were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And it goes on down through there, and in verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt with us. The Lord Jesus Christ had his part in the creation of the universe. Going back to Genesis chapter 1, the creation story. It says, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. It goes on down through there. And then it says, and God said, let us make man after our likeness and after our image. The Lord Jesus Christ was sovereign then as the creator of all of the universe. Everything that you see was created. It didn't just happen over millions, millions and billions of years. All of the universe and everything that's on this earth was created in six 24-hour, literal 24-hour periods of time. And Christ had his part as the creator of the universe. But not only the creator of the universe, but the controller of world events. The Lord Jesus Christ knows everything that's going on in the world. Nothing escapes His attention. See, things happen to us. Tragedies come in our lives. Sickness comes in our life. And oftentimes it catches us totally by surprise. But nothing catches the Lord Jesus Christ by surprise. He is in control of everything that happens in this world. And nothing is a surprise to him. We read through the Bible and we see how he raises up kings, how he takes kings down. He raises up nations. He takes nations down. 
And I'm reminded of the in the Bible where it says that the nations and the people that forget God shall be turned into hell. The world today hates the creator of the universe. The world today, for the most part, hates the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he stands for. So he's the creator of the universe, the controller of the world events. And then in his sovereignty, a third thing I see is that he is conqueror over Satan. Look at Genesis chapter 3 for just a moment. Remember Genesis chapter 3 deals with the fall of man. God created man in Genesis chapter 1 and then Genesis chapter 2 talks again. A little bit different aspect about the, the creation and all that's in it. But not long after God created man, man falls into sin. And God comes looking for Adam and Eve. Not that he didn't know where they were, but when he said, Adam, where fort art thou? He was merely trying to get Adam's attention so that Adam would realize that what he had done. And look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and upon every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of life. And notice this. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The Lord Jesus Christ ultimately, as the sovereign of the universe, will be a conqueror over Satan. The Lord Jesus Christ conquered death, he conquered hell, he conquered the grave. No doubt the devil thought when Christ was crucified, the devil's not omnipotent, he doesn't know all things. No doubt when Christ was crucified, the devil and all of the wicked angels had their moment of happiness. We've finally gotten rid of him. He's gone. But three days later, <laughs> the king of the universe rose from the dead, never to die again. And today he's sitting at the right hand. God the Father in heaven ever making intercession for us. Amen. So we've seen Jesus in his sovereignty. Second, this morning I'd like for us to see Jesus in his sacrifice. Look for a moment, if you would, at Isaiah chapter 53. It has been said that if any Orthodox Jew would read Isaiah chapter 53 with an open heart and compare that to what the Lord Jesus Christ did, that they would have to realize and understand that Christ is the one that Isaiah is speaking about in chapter 53. But Isaiah chapter 53, we won't read every verse, but look at verse 3, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We have hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Notice this, surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, praise God, with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep, have gone astray and have turned every one of us to his own way. And the Lord, notice this, had laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord Jesus Christ, in Isaiah chapter 53, is the slain lamb. The Lord Jesus Christ paid the sin debt for all humanity. He paid our eternity in hell. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, we're told that he was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Remember John chapter 1 and verse 29, when John the Baptist was baptizing in the river Jordan and he sees Jesus coming, and what did he say? He said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. So in Christ's sacrifice, he was the slain lamb. But not only was he the slain lamb, he was the sufficient lamb over 
and over and over again in the book of Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10, it talks about Christ's one-time sacrifice. He offered himself one time for the sins of mankind. One time he suffered on the cross and shed his blood. One time he died. And his one time death was sufficient to pay the sin debt for all of humanity. Hebrews chapter 6. The wording in there, Bible scholars say all different kinds of things, but the fact of the matter is that if it were possible for a person to lose their their salvation, we know it's not, but if it were possible for a person to lose their salvation in order for them to uh, to be saved again, Christ would have to die. He would have to suffer a second time and be put to an open shame. We're told in Hebrews chapter 10 that priests, the Old Testament priests, day after day after day they stood and it said they offered oftentimes the same sacrifice, that bloody sacrifice when they would slay the lamb, slay the animals, and offer that bloody sacrifice to Christ. It said that could never, never take away sin. But this man... The Lord Jesus Christ suffered one time. He paid the ultimate. He gave his life that you and I might go free. Sir, we would see Jesus in his sacrifice as the slain lamb, in the sufficiency of his sacrifice, but also as our substitute. Folks, you and I can never be good enough to go to heaven on our own. The Bible says that all of our righteousnesses in Isaiah 64, 6, everything that you and I could possibly do, all of our righteousness are as filthy rags in the sight of God. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are ye saved, through faith in that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Folks, you cannot work. You could never Do enough works to be righteous in the sight of God. God hates our self-righteous works. God hates it when man tries. You ever hear the saying to pull himself up by his own bootstraps? You can't do that. Why? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Everything that you and I could possibly do in an attempt to earn salvation is not good enough. Jesus paid it all. He who knew no sin became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Sir, we would see Jesus in his sovereignty Sir, we would see Jesus in his sacrifice. And third, sir, we would see Jesus in his salvation. Look in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead you get that? Dead. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we also had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. And of the mind, which were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But notice the first two words of verse 4, but God. (laughs) To that I say, hallelujah, but God. 
Folks, lost people are dead in their trespasses and sins. Think about your life before you trusted Christ as your Savior. Oh, you were walking around. I was walking around. I thought I was having a great old time, a good old time living in sin. I was physically alive, but spiritually I was dead, deader than a doornail. I was spiritually dead, and I was on my way to hell. Remember Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? They fellowshiped with God every day. God came in the cool of the evening and he walked with them and talked with them and fellowshiped with them. But then after they sinned, what happened? That relationship was severed. and Spiritually, they were dead. And they hid themselves from, tried to hide themselves from God. Tried to cover their nakedness with their own self-righteousness, with their own leaves. That wasn't good enough. God shed two little innocent animals and he clothed them with his righteousness. Sinners are dead in trespasses and sins. There's nothing. Nothing that a lost person can do to please God. Nothing that a lost person can do to gain favor with God. But not only... Are lost people dead in trespasses and sins? But lost people are deceived. They're deceived. Have you ever heard someone say, I'm just as good as old so-and-so down there at your church? I would come down there to your church, but ain't nothing but a bunch of hypocrites down there at your church. Have you ever, ever heard that when you invite folks to come to church? You know, when people say that to me, you know what I say? I say, you know, why don't you really get your heart white with Christ why don't you really get saved and come on down there to Emmanuel Baptist Church and show us hypocrites how to live a life that's pleasing unto the Lord you see the devil will put one excuse after another in the hearts of lost people to keep them from being saved how often have you shared the gospel with a lost person I tried to think and it's too many for me to even begin to, to try to count. But you'll share the gospel. You will see conviction come in the heart of a lost person. And then you ask them about a decision of accepting Christ. And how many times will you hear them say, I believe everything that you said, but. They don't believe everything that you said. Because In my life, when I realized that if I were to die in my situation that I was going straight to hell, when I really realized that, I did something about it. I believe everything you said, preacher. I believe everything you said. You know, sometimes I just want to grab them and throw them up against the wall and say, no, you didn't. Repent, but you can't do that. All you can do is just share the gospel. But lost people are deceived. They're self-righteous. I'm just as good as old so-and-so, that hypocrite down there at your church. But sometimes the devil will use religion to deceive people. Buddy, were you deceived? Yeah. Amen. Buddy's a converted Mormon. I was deceived for 25 years. I was a Roman Catholic. But God saves Mormons. God saves Roman Catholics. God will save Buddhists. God will save anyone who will come to him in simple faith by his grace and repent of their sins. Lost people are dead. Lost people are deceived. But lost people, not only that, this is the most important thing, lost people are damned. They're damned and doomed to hell. In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Jesus gives his great commission. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth, what comes first, the belief, and is baptized. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. 
And the implication there in the original Greek language is, hey, even if you're baptized, but you don't believe, you're just a wet sinner. So many folks, another deception of the devil, so many folks think that just because they're baptized in a baptismal pool somewhere, that everything's all right. I don't know how many times over the years I've talked to people and they, well, I was baptized when I was 12 years old. I'm a member of such and such a church. Baptism, folks, does not and cannot save a single person. Baptism is merely an outward expression of what has already happened on the inside. Over the years when I've baptized folks, uh, as we're in the baptismal pool, I ask them, Brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? They'll say, yes, preacher. And I'll say, would you want to be baptized now in his name? Yes, preacher. Then my brother or my sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Boom. Buried with him in his baptism, raised again to walk in newness of life. It's only an identification if they went down a lost sinner, they're going to come back up a lost sinner. And all the water in the world cannot save anybody. Lost people who are dead in their trespasses and sins, their ultimate end is hell. Eternity in hell. That's where the world is headed and all the lost people to hell. Apart from the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sir, we would see Jesus in his salvation, dead, deceived, damned. But thank God for the deliverance. Amen. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 says, There's none righteous. No, not one. Verse 23 says, For all. And his pastor so often says, What does that word all mean? All. <laughs> for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us in Romans 6 and 23, there's a wage. There's a wage, just like those of you that work. When you work your job, you expect to get paid either once a month, every two weeks, every month, however, every week, how often you get paid. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus the Lord. The wages of sin is death, spiritual death, eternal separation from the Lord Jesus Christ. But God's gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. Can you imagine that? 2,000 years ago, Nearly now, Christ was on the cross. He was thinking about Robert Thomas. He was thinking about Sister Angela. He was thinking about Jamie. He was thinking about Diane. He was thinking about all of us in here today. And if it had only been Sister Angela or only been Brother Russell or only been you, he would have still went to the cross and died and shed his blood to pay your sin debt that you could not pay yourselves. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, talks about if we, can set, if we confess our sins, it talks about confession. Turn over to Romans, if you would, for just a moment. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call, that means just ask, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Amen. How is a person saved? First of all, in order to be saved, you have to be lost. Yeah. 
In order for a person to be saved, they have to be lost. You say, what do you mean by that, preacher? You can't be saved until you realize in your own mind and accept the fact in your own mind that you're lost. Accept the fact there's nothing you can do to save yourself. Because all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. But God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So in order to be saved, first of all, a person must realize they're lost. They must realize there's no way they can save themselves. They must realize that Christ, through His one-time sacrifice, He paid their sin debt. He paid it all. And see, God's grace, the Bible says, remember, we mentioned it, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, by grace are you saved through faith. God's grace just simply means unmerited favor. Every one of us in here, all we deserve is hell. You know, when you think about it, even as saved individuals, we've committed enough sins after we were saved that God still could send us to hell, but he won't. But the fact of the matter is God's grace, something we don't deserve through faith. Believing that Christ paid our sin debt. And then what does the Bible teach? The Bible says when we realize we're lost, when we realize we can't save ourselves, when we realize that Christ paid our eternity in hell, that he paid our sin debt, then what do we do? We repent. What does the word repent mean? It means to change directions. Just repent. Forsake your sinful lifestyle. Does that mean I'm going to be perfect when I'm saved? No, far from it. But you just repent of your sins. And then by God's grace through our faith and believing in his finished work, you ask Christ to come in your heart and life and be your Savior. And then take him at his word. We would see Jesus in his salvation. He provided a deliverance. He provided an escape for you and me and for the whole world. But yet lost people, ultimately, if you, when you were saved, on that day you were saved, you had to make a decision. Joshua said, Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. It's a personal decision that everyone who's lost, if you're truly saved today at one time in your life, you made that personal decision. No one could make it for you. I couldn't make it for you. Your friends couldn't make it for you. It's a personal decision that you made on your own to say yes to Christ. Sixty-seven people this week professed Christ. Every one of them, Brother Copeland and Sister Copeland, made a personal decision, didn't they? After being presented with the gospel, they made a personal decision to accept Christ as their Savior. Just pray that all of them meant business. But see, the Bible says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. And folks, don't believe for one minute that everyone that walks the aisle of Emmanuel Baptist Church or any other church, and they profess Christ as their Savior, and then they're baptized would to God that every one of them meant business. Would to, would to God that every one of them was truly saved. But oftentimes their fruit bears it out. Jesus said, remember the sower went and sowed the seed? Some fell by the wayside. Some fell among thorns. Some fell in the rocky places, didn't bring forth any fruit. But praise God, some fell among the good soil. And it brought forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. And see, once we have been declared righteous and we're truly saved, once we've been justified in the sight of God, then the process of sanctification, oh, Brother Robert, another theological term, no, that just means growing in the Lord. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman, needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible says... We're to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. And folks who have truly been saved, there will be some fruit in their lives. We would see Jesus in his sovereignty. We would see Jesus in his sacrifice. We would see Jesus in his salvation. 
fourthly, I want us for just a couple of minutes to see Jesus in his security. You see, when I grew up, I was in bondage to religion, to religious system. And I was taught that you could not know that you had eternal life. I was taught that you could not know for sure if you were going to heaven. I was taught even furthermore that if you were to even proclaim, I know that I'm truly saved, I know that I'm going to heaven, there's no doubt in my mind, I was taught that that was a terrible, terrible sin. It was called a sin of presumption. And you see, you've not presumed upon anybody. Why? I'm glad you asked why. What did Jesus promise in John chapter 10? He talks about his sheep. His sheep know him. He knows them. They follow him. What does he say? I give unto them eternal life. You see, folks, there's only, two, there's only, there's eternal life. What does eternal mean? Never ending, without end, forever. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. They shall never be cast into hell. There's either there's eternal life or there's conditional life. You see, for the 25 years that I was in religion, I had conditional life. It was conditioned on my works, conditional on me being faithful and working and working. And see, I could lose my conditional salvation, but the Bible just says nothing about conditional salvation. The Bible speaks about eternal salvation, eternal life. Jesus says that he gives his sheep eternal life. He promises them they should never perish in John chapter 10. And then he says, my sheep are in my hand. And no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. And then he goes on one step further and he says, my father is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. The Lord Jesus promises us that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us. He's promised us eternal life. He's promised us that as his children we will never perish. But look for a moment concerning his protection in Jude chapter 24, or Jude verse 24. Just one chapter in Jude, Jude verse 24. Jude 24, it says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you, notice this, faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I see two things in that. I see the falling and the faultless. The Lord Jesus Christ is able to keep us from losing our salvation, able to keep us from falling. But not only that, but he presents us faultless. He presents us righteous to the Father. You know, folks, quite frankly, if it was up to us and we could lose our salvation, we'd lose it. <laughs> I think about my life and all the things that I've done, even since I was saved all the things that I knew that I should have done that I didn't do, all the things that I did that I knew that I shouldn't do. But Christ, He's able to keep us from falling. He's given us eternal life. He gives us as security, knowing that we're saved, and it's because of what He did that he presents us faultless. He presents us totally justified. He presents us ultimately totally sanctified and he presents us to God the Father. <coughs> and he's never lost one of his sheep. You know, the greatest thing that I have had in these 47 years since I've been saved is the assurance knowing that I'm saved. And I can stand here this morning, and you can too if you've truly been saved, and I can say without apology, I know that I know 
that I know that I know that I know that my name is written in the book of life. I know that if I were to fall over dead right now of a heart attack, as Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And there's no doubt in my mind that I know when my life on this earth is over, I'm going home to heaven immediately to be with the Lord who loved me, shed his blood and died for me that I might be saved and I might have eternal life. Sir, we would see Jesus in his security. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, it talks about the dead, small and great, standing before God. And it says the books were opened, and God judged the dead out of the things that were written in the book. It says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And verse 15 has these sombering words. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Sir, we would see Jesus in his sovereignty as the creator of the stainer of the universe. We would see Jesus in his sacrifice, dying on the cross, shedding his blood, paying the sin debt that we could not pay ourselves. We would see Jesus in his salvation. He provided a way for us to escape hell but it's an individual decision and we would see Christ in his security. John 8.32 is the theme verse for our radio program. We're going on 11 years now, start of every radio program. John 8.32 says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And then we oftentimes after that we quote John 8.36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. You see, Christ paid the sin debt that we could not pay ourselves. I don't know your heart. I don't know whether you're truly saved or not, but God knows and ultimately you know. Sir, we would see Jesus. Would you stand to your feet, please, with heads bowed and eyes closed? We presented the message today that we felt God would have us to present. We clearly laid out the plan of salvation. Now it's up to you with heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. Is there one here this morning? And I assure you, even if I know your name, I will not embarrass you, but all I want to do is pray for you. No one's looking around. Is there one here this morning? It would say, preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure that I'd go to heaven. Would you pray for me? Just raise your hand and, and I promise you I'll pray for you. Is there one here today? that you're not saved. All right, is there one here today or more than one that you're not where you ought to be with the Lord spiritually? You failed the Lord. You may be walking far away from the Lord. No, you're not lost. You've not lost your salvation. But you need to get some things right with the Lord. Would you just raise your hand? Brother Robert, pray for me. I see hands. There's more than one hand. Yes, I see all those hands. The Lord knows your heart. Is there another one? Brother Robert, pray for me. I need to get some things right with the Lord, all right? The Lord knows the hearts. We've seen that, and I want to pray for you right now. Father, we presented the message that we felt that you would have us to present, Lord. For those that raise their hands, if they're not where they ought to be with you spiritually, we pray, Lord, that you might deal with them, speak to their hearts, and today might be the day they get things right with you. And then, Lord, if perhaps there's one here that was even too embarrassed this morning to raise their hand that they weren't saved, we pray the Holy Spirit will deal with them. This might be the day they come to know Christ as their Savior. And if you're here today and you're not saved, why not come forward? And someone will take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. All right, as we, we're not going to tarry long for the invitation, but if God's dealt with you, the altar's open for you to come at this time. knows your heart. We don't know your heart, but we just pray that if you need to do business with the Lord, the altar's open. If you'll come and do business with the Lord. All right. Thank you for coming this morning. Thank you for your attention. Remember to be back. Choir practice at 5. The evening service at 6. Just thank you for coming and remember all the prayer requests.
Uh, Brother Copeland, would you dismiss in prayer, please, this morning?